Hi, I'm Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. This afternoon, we're in conversation with Amandeep Singh Gill, United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Technology. Welcome to RightsCon. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, just some housekeeping as usual. Um, if you want to ask questions and you're here at Costa Rica, there's a QR code. Uh, we are using a Slido as our way of asking questions. And if you're online, uh, do so through the Slido button as well. I tend to check questions as we get going. There's no Q&A at the very back. I try to integrate the questions. So put in your questions and we'll get to them as soon as possible. Also, if you're in the audience and you have the headphones, uh, remember that if it's, the sound is low, you have a volume button there to help you. Now, just a little bit more about Amandeep. In addition to being UN Secretary General's Envoy on Tech, he is the CEO of the International Digital Health and Artificial Intelligence Research Collaborative Project uh, based at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, Geneva. And he has also in the past worked on regulating artificial intelligence in lethal autonomous weapons systems in 2017 and 2018. I might have actually been in one of those Geneva meetings um, as a reporter. Uh, watching what he was doing, and in addition, he was India's ambassador to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. So thank you very much once again. I want to just start off with a scene setter. Uh, the hottest tech topic of the year, the hottest tech topic at RightsCon, artificial intelligence. And the question is whether we are destined to repeat the mistakes of the past in terms of governments and institutions being behind uh, regulation on this development. Thanks, Melissa. And uh, let me just say that I very much wanted to be in person at RightsCons. And so my loss that I'm not there sitting next to you and we're not talking in person, but this is the next best thing. And hopefully I'll be there in person at the next uh, RightsCon. Now, your question, the danger is real that we'll miss this moment, just as we did at the beginning of the social media revolution, uh, when we were promised that uh, social media platforms would advance freedom, liberty of expression, uh, inclusiveness, etc. cetera. And, and somehow we didn't pay enough attention to the harms and the risks, uh, and the rest is history. And today, the gap between what public officials know and can do is even bigger than what it was at that time, uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, so this danger is real and we really need to get our act together quickly. With that, I want to ask you about the Global Digital Compact. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I actually spent some time um, before, before you know, preparing for this interview, reading about it. It's very ambitious. There's a lot of things about AI, data protection, human rights, and technology. Um, I have to confess it was a little jargony for me. So if I had difficulty understanding it, perhaps some others also, and this would be a great opportunity for you to explain this a little further. So I sympathize with uh, you and others who feel that uh, there's too much packed in there. Um, this is a very complex field uh, from internet governance, uh, connectivity, to data protection, data empowerment, to the regulation of artificial intelligence. There are a number of very complex subjects um, and um, it's, uh, it's a challenge to put everything together into uh, an impactful document. I think we've done a good job. The Secretary General launched the policy brief uh, yesterday. Uh, what perhaps you know, I can do to have the audience appreciate the main vision behind the policy brief is to point out the following three things. First, this is an opportunity for us to agree on some shared principles and objectives mm. on addressing digital governance gaps. So the Secretary General's brief 
into the global digital compact underlines that opportunity. We have one year plus to get there. So we have time, but we need to work hard since the subject is complex to get to that common vision shared framework so that across the globe, we have a shared vision of how to move forward towards a human centric digital future. Second, principles are not enough. A vision, shared vision is not enough. We have to have actions and those actions have to be married to accountability. So whether it's governments or the private sector, they need to be accountable for implementing the global digital compact. So there's an emphasis mm. in the Secretary General's ideas on the global digital compact, on those practical actions, on um, enhancing accountability of both governments and the private sector. And finally, we need to have more of a regular follow up, a regular review of how we are doing on these issues, particularly in the light of the fast movement on technologies like generative AI. Right. It's not enough for us to meet every five years at the meetings of the World Summit on Information Society or to meet in other forums which are kind of distributed across different platforms. We need something that can bring these different threads together and enhance the learning, the sharing of best practices, the sharing of lessons learned across uh, borders and across different uh, uh, digital sectors. So essentially, those are the foundations of the Global Digital Compact. Got it. And the eight, yeah, the eight subjects are familiar to your audience, from human rights online to internet fragmentation, to governance AI, to addressing online harm, et cetera. You talk about a shared vision, uh, but even within countries, people are debating about the vision. Uh, I don't think China and Russia and the United States have, I, I find it really hard to believe a world where they would have alignment on uh, the guardrails they want to put in place for AI, for example. You talk about action and accountability. Let's not even look at China, let's look at the United States and the accountability of these tech companies. There's been no accountability, very little accountability. Facebook, Meta, Twitter, so on and so forth. So this sounds fantastic what you're proposing, but I, I guess in an earlier conversation on this stage, somebody expressed a lot of cynicism, frankly, about the United Nations and what it can do. Could you give us a, what, how, can you, can, how can you reassure us? How do you respond to criticism? Right, so um, in my work over the past few years in both multilateral forums and multi-stakeholder forums, I've seen the pluses and minuses of different approaches to building international consensus. In some ways, there's no alternative to a universal forum, such as the United Nations, where everyone is present, where you have ways to constantly uphold certain principles, where you have a foundation over decades, that's been built up over decades, a foundation in human rights, human rights standards, the principles of the UN Charter, that's unparalleled. So no other institution has that foundation in norms, has that universality, has that regularity in terms of discussions that the United Nations has. Now, to the cynics, mm -hmm. I say, yes, the UN can be so, uh, and the UN is often beset by the least common denominator. Uh, and today, the geopolitical situation is not easy. You mentioned uh, Russia, China, and the US, so the major powers are at overheads over a variety of issues. Uh, and it's not easy to make progress. But I think we have an opportunity to get digital right, and by getting digital right, also reboot multilateralism. Mm. Because we need multilateralism not only for digital, but for addressing our climate change challenges and many other 
challenges. So if we can somehow, and I see a window of opportunity, mm. call me an optimist, but I see a window of opportunity, a once in a generation opportunity next year, to come together and craft something that's positive, that's based in our shared human values, uh, and that has um, a chance of being implemented just not not just in a few countries, mm -hmm. but uh, in uh, most of the globe, especially the 150 odd countries who do not have uh, the high tech sectors that a handful of countries have, they're actually looking for guidance. Yeah. You know, how do we handle them? And so where do you see leadership on this? Is it uh, the EU? Because the EU has been more skeptical of technological developments than, say, the United States. Are you seeing positive developments on, on, from them? And that is where you're focusing or reaching out for leadership on? I see the opportunity for leadership in all groups. Uh, the EU certainly has uh, put human rights, human dignity, human agency front and center in its policies. Uh, uh, it is uh, approaching innovation as well as governance in a balanced way, I think, through with the slew of uh, legislative uh, initiatives that are on the table. But I see leadership also in other countries, for example, the Global South. Uh, in many countries, you have seen the use of digital public infrastructure, digital public goods, to bring large numbers of the population into the financial mainstream, uh, women, entrepreneurs, and others. Uh, so taking a comprehensive view of human rights, including social, economic, and cultural rights, you know, you see other leaders emerging. And smaller states, the digital pioneers uh, from uh, Estonia, mm -hmm. Ukraine with its DIA app, and many other countries, Rwanda, uh, Cape Verde, they are moving forward with uh, some good examples that we need to curate, we need to share, I mean, and you use to guide. Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag, so it's always hard when it's a, it's a video conferencing in. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I mean, you mentioned Ukraine, and, and I had this as something listed for, for if we had time, but, I'm, but since it's come up, um, you've worked on trying to regulate lethal autonomous weapons, very hard toil um, on, on that front. And, um, and uh, with Ukraine, we've seen there's a very um, ambitious, you know, proactive digital minister doing a lot of things that are really interesting. But it's a country that's also been using drones in new ways, as has Russia. Um, and precisely because of your background um, trying to negotiate in Geneva with lethal autonomous weapons, drones, killer robots, however you want to call it, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Um, I'm not entirely sure if it follows, falls under the Global Digital Compact a little bit in terms of overlap, but we are talking about new technology, the combination of drones and artificial intelligence, um, and uh, would love your, your thoughts on what the Ukrainians are doing and the Russians are doing. Yeah, I know you're right. This is not exactly uh, a topic for the Global Digital Compact. Uh, some of these themes will be covered in the new Agenda for Peace discussion. Mm. Let me just say that the Secretary General has been very clear that technology cannot be allowed to take isolated decisions. Uh, so fortunately, today, we do not have a situation where you have fully autonomous systems that can take life. Uh, there is a human element, and although I'm worried that the human element is getting more and more obscured, um, and it will have consequences in terms of you know, our human values as well. But uh, fingers crossed, so far, we don't have fully lethal autonomous weapon system. Right. Uh, so those pose challenges for international humanitarian law, the distinction between civilians and combatants, uh, proportionality, and other principles, and also international human rights law, what it means to be human, you know, who's allowed to take life. Uh, and these are issues that will also come up on the health side, for instance. Mm. What systems you allow that can override uh, human supervision in terms of a terminally, terminally ill patient, for instance. So we need to um, have clear rules in place 
may be some prohibitions and the secretary general has been very clear about a prohibition on these autonomous weapons taking lives uh, and other areas where we can take more risk based approaches married with human rights based approach and on that note, there's been a few questions that's come in. Um, I want to bring this in because I suspect this conversation could go on um, a fair, fair, fair bit on spyware. How has regulation of spyware changed in the past few years? And um, I, I wonder um, what is happening under the auspices of the UN in that sense. This is a very tricky area. Uh, so far, the regulation that has happened has been through export control um, frameworks, either national or uh, small group export control arrangements, uh, where such uh, sophisticated um, software is uh, regulated as dual use technologies um, uh, in, 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 uh, in certain groups of countries. Um, but we've not seen, except in discussions on the human rights implication in specific cases, mm. uh, calls for uh, regulation of these at an international basis, um, uh, on an international basis. Uh, so what I would suggest is that if we can get the human rights accountability of private sector for the products and services that they put online, so the harm that those products may cause, if the accountability can be sharpened, that is the way to get at not only this, but many other products that may have implications for human rights. Uh, so uh, this is something that we need to have a discussion on next year when the negotiations happen. Uh, the Secretary General has put some ideas on the table in terms of sharpening accountability. One is a human rights advisory body to be uh, steered by the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, uh, my friend and colleague, Volker Turk. Um, and, uh, you know, across the UN system, we... Uh, can work together to put in place this kind of a mechanism that builds on the foundation of the business and human rights work over the years and that the OHCHR has led in Geneva. Got it. Um, there are a few questions about the Global Digital Compact. Why are you creating a digital cooperation forum to follow the development and implementation of the GDC if the IGF can do that and is even doing it right now? And I'll have to ask you to explain the acronym for IGF. I apologize. No problem. So that's the Internet Governance Forum, Got it. a multi-stakeholder forum that was created in 2005. Uh, and the Secretary General was asked to put it together. Uh, this is um, a forum that meets regularly every year. Last meeting was in Addis Ababa. Next meeting is in Kyoto in Japan. It's a very important multi-stakeholder forum mm. where civil society is very active. Uh, it doesn't have decision-making power, so it's a discussion forum, an important discussion forum. Um, and there is a reason why the governance of the Internet has been... Uh, somehow protected from more intergovernmental type of considerations. Now, that's to keep the uh, internet apolitical, uh, not run by governments, um, in a sense. Uh, and, and that has important considerations and implications uh, today. And so the um, question is, a, um, why isn't the uh, digital uh, cooperation forum under the auspices of the IGVF. So that's my answer. Right. That's my answer. You know, you do not want to burden the IGF with policy issues, which will take it in the direction of intergovernmental forums and considerations, which will uh, significantly mutate its mandate, and will have implications in the long run for how the internet uh, might be run. So I won't be cautious there. Essentially, what's the Digital Cooperation Forum? It is not a new, in a sense, uh, 
I mean, it's not meant to duplicate anything. The IGF will have its own role, it will constitute to have its own role. Uh, it is meant to bring together these various threads of discussions so that we have a more regular, less siloed look at how we are doing on digital cooperation. It's not meant to dictate to governments and businesses who sign up to the Global Digital Com Compact how to implement it, but it is supposed to uphold accountability and transparency. And most importantly, it is meant to be done in a tripartite fashion. Mm. Uh, so for the first time, the Secretary General has proposed in his policy brief um, a steering committee for this kind of a forum that would have representatives from governments, from civil society and from businesses. So civil society has an opportunity, in fact, uh, to up its participation mm. in, the, in some of the policy discussions uh, that it has not been part of so far. And we have an opportunity to drive a line action uh, and bring all stakeholders uh, together in a global framework. There is an adjacent question um, to this, which is uh, why is the UN changing to a multilateral government to government approach for the implementation of the GDC and not the multi-stakeholderism we are currently doing right now? That's not correct. Okay. Uh, so the implement, as I said, the GDC in, in our view so far, there's a process that's underway. So it's to be adopted next year. I mean, the Secretary General is very clear about it, that it should be open for adoption by both governments and other stakeholders. They sh should all be able to sign up and say, you know, we will take this forward. And in his conception of the regular review and follow up, all three major stakeholder groups are again involved in how it is taken forward. So it's multi stakeholder by design and uh, in terms of implementation. The negotiation, of course, you know, that's the nature of the beast today. You know, we have a, a system, intergovernmental system, so negotiations on things that have some kind of an impact in mm. terms of you know, not just legal impact, but semi-legal in a sense, soft norm type of an impact. They are intergovernmental, but we are trying to kind of stretch it in a sense to make sure that other, you know, it, it is uh, multi-stakeholder, um, in a sense, in terms of not just consultations, inputs into it, but also how it is shaped and how it is run. Great. Um, for this uh, remaining section of our conversation, I want to actually pull back a little bit and ask you about, I mean, a lot of the focus these days is on AI. It's the hot topic. It's the start of the conversation. But um, some of the people I've spoken with at RightsCon just in the last day or so, have said that you know so much of the focus is on AI, but we've got these other problems, these old problems. There's still problems, and we want to make sure people don't forget about it. For example, social media. Um, could you talk a little bit about that uh, in terms of what should be done, where you see progress? Yes, and in many ways, the old problems and the new problems are similar. For instance, the governance capacity, the regulatory capacity, uh, the lack of due diligence, proper due diligence, the lack of oversight, the lack of transparency in terms of uh, what the impact of the technology is, the lack of life cycle assessment. So we've seen that with social media. Uh, we've seen that with, as you mentioned, spyware and some of the very targeted uh, digital um, products mm -hmm. and now we see that artificial intelligence uh, so we cannot forget those problems and therefore what's the answer the answer is uh, to address some critical emerging issues the concentration of power the lack of transparency and uh, data sharing on uh, technology the lack of regulatory capacity. For decades, there's been underinvestment in the public sector and public technology. Uh, the uh, digital literacy of citizens, uh, ju uh, journalists, I mean, uh, I, I dare say old fashioned journalism needs much more investment. If we are to be able to handle, uh, you know, what some people are saying, half a million synthetic media 
um, thesis this year itself. You know, thanks to generative AI, so we are to a handle misleading and harmful content, whether it's coming on old social media platforms or new tools based on large language models, we need to build up that literacy, um, that uh, capacity. And above all, I would say, you know, that this, is, this really trumps it as we need to connect governance across the globe. We've long focused on connectivity for everyone. That's important. You know, my colleague Doreen would tell you we have 2.7 million people who are still offline and we need to do much better on this and uh, we are addressing that. But I think we need to connect the governance efforts. You mentioned the European Union, the US, uh, the big countries in the global south. Make sure that there are no gaps in governance and that these uh, technologies don't move off to areas where um, Great. And there is a source. Um, for my last question, I want to ask you, um, circle back to where we started, which is artificial intelligence. Uh, you know about like the one line, you know, sort of doomsday s warning that many scientists and engineers have signed on to about how dangerous artificial intelligence is. I wonder where you stand on that as someone who has looked and worked on all this different technology that could go wrong, right? The, the killer robots and so on. Uh, do you feel that AI is indeed special and different or is it just another technology of the moment? I don't think we should consider AI as special, uh, but it is a very powerful technology. And it's a powerful technology in the sense it hacks uh, human culture hacks language, the way we communicate, the way we understand, the way we influence each other. And this, these large language models are showing us that. So the risk comes from, the immediate danger comes from how we humans use this technology. And sorry about the New York music behind us. That's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's not killer robots are likely to kind of, you know, in the near future uh, and cause us irreparable harm as, a hum as human civilization. But it's us humans using this technology in unregulated, stupid ways uh, to create mass delusion, uh, to, you know, trifle with things because, you know, it's coming from places where people don't have a full understanding of the impact. So it's like, you know, you, you are passing on the risk to other sections of society and to future generations hmm. without sufficient power. And that's really dangerous. Amandeep Singh Gill, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. And that's it for now at RightsCon main, stu uh, main stage, rather. We hope you enjoy the other sessions and as always, stay engaged.